Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Monarch Center for Autism today for our webinar entitled Current and Emerging Technology, Enhancing the Lives of Individuals with Autism. I hope you are able to connect to us smoothly this morning. Please note audio for this webinar is available either through your computer speakers or via conference call. If you have a question during the webinar, you'll see a green tab at the top of your screen. If you scroll over it, you'll find a chat button. If you have a technical question during the webinar, please feel free to send it to me, Lauren Domenico. I'm also listed as all panelists. And if you have a content question, please send it to Dana Munn, who is listed as your host. At the end of the webinar, our presenter, Chris Carter, will address all, tech, all content questions. And I'm happy to answer the technical questions throughout. In the next few days, we will post the presentation and an archived recording of the webinar on our website, and I will send you an email with links as soon as they're available. So without further ado, I am very pleased to hand it over to our speaker, Chris Carter, who is the Educational Technology Specialist at Monarch Center for Autism. Thank you again so much for joining us today. All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, my name is Chris Carter. Um, what we're going to be covering today is our the current and emerging technologies and enhancing lives with, with for individuals with autism. Um, this presentation um, for me is kind of a really kind of a cool one because I'm always really interested in not only what's out in the field right now, but what's to come down the pipeline. Hopefully, we can cover a lot of that within this presentation. Uh, a little bit about me, that's me, you should probably see me on your screen right now. Uh, I've been with Monarch Center for about eight years now. Um, I started there in 2006 as, a, uh, as an assistant in the classrooms. Um, eventually I moved on to uh, uh, working with Monarch Teaching Technologies and helped design elements of Vizzle. And then uh, from there I moved on to Monarch Center for Autism, or back to Monarch Center for Autism, I should say, uh, in order to help assist with the data system. Um, right now I my chief responsibilities are data system and introducing new technologies in the classroom. In this uh, presentation, I've also included my email address. Um, so if you would like to email me, you're always welcome to. Um, I'm pretty prompt about answering emails, but if you have any questions about the presentation after or anything after that, you'll have this uh, to refer back to. Okay, so some things that we're going to go over in today's agenda here. Uh, we're going to go over some current technology. Within that current technology, we're, we're just going to briefly go over what is assistive technologies and some of the assistive technologies we use with children with autism. Uh, also, within those technologies, we're going to go over iPads. Uh, and we're also going to go over some of the apps that we use with children from iPads. Uh, we're going to go over video modeling, smart boards, uh, some emerging technologies, some, uh, the wearables under those emerging technologies, AI, and robotics. So with further ado, we're going to start off with current technology. So assistive technologies. Uh, a lot of these things are, it can be simple things, they can be complex things. Um, what assistive technology is defined as is any type or any item, piece of, of equipment or product system, whether acquired commercially or, of, or off the shelf, that should be modified, uh, <laughs> or customized that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So a lot of these you probably see around the typical classroom. Uh, for us, uh, we use a combination of many different technologies from low, middle, to high. Low technologies are those things such as just the pencil holders, something that gives the child the ability to grip onto the pencil a little bit better, or in this day and age, the ability to grip, on, grip onto a stylus a little bit better. Uh, Middle technologies, which these can be your buzzers, uh, time timers, any sort of kind of thing that doesn't have a lot of electronics really into it and isn't very complicated, but really has a simple one unit use type thing. Um, high tech technologies, this includes our computers, tablets, and evolving technologies as well, too. Um, so the big field of this really is augmentative and uh, augmentative technology. Um, for individuals on the spectrum, one of the biggest uh, uh, focal points is usually communication. With uh, AACs, um, we're able to communicate with an individual with autism. Uh, there are two, uh, they come in two different forms really. 
unaided, uh, which is sign language, and then device and aided, which is like devices. A lot of the uh, aided devices um, have really evolved over the last few years. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, simple ones and a lot of complex ones. Simple ones would be things like as a Big Mac. This is something that you can just tap the button and it has one or two words that you can just tap and it gives the child the ability to speak. Um, we use a lot of these as kind of responses, um, things like I need help, stuff like that. Uh, the Big Mac uh, has a single switch. Um, it allows 20 seconds of record time. These retail around $89. Uh, these you can also be hooked up to a speaker. They do have aux out and stuff like that on the back there too. Um, getting a little bit more complex, there are things like the Go Talk out there. Uh, the Go Talk uh, ranges in quite a bit different sizes, as you can see from the uh, side images over here. You can have one, four, nine, twenty, thirty-two. They even make a pocket size one as well, too. They also range in price because of all the differences in them. Recently, within the last year or so, Go Talk also has now ventured into uh, producing apps as well for children with autism. They have a free version of the app that is out there in the market. Uh, it's lim limited by the number of uh, slides you can put on there. Um, but you can also upgrade to a full version, of 70, which is $79, which will allow you to create a similar grid size uh, uh, device using an iPad um, or Android device. The only uh, disadvantage to the analog or the physical version of these is there is no way to really back them up. Um, so if uh, students Devices damage, you have to go back and re record all of these audio inputs. Um, that's where you have a little bit more of an advantage from those uh, devices that are on, like, an uh, iPad or Android device. You can at least back up uh, work that's done on there. Going into uh, the assistive technologies, a large field of this is human interface devices. Um, these are such things as assistive keyboards, mice. Um, assist, the human interface devices are basically allow you to interact with other devices as well. Uh, a good part of that uh, would be for looking at the mice or assistive trackpads. Um, so if you're looking at a traditional mouse, like I'm using one right now, basically gives you two clicks left, right, uh, and I can move my cursor around on the screen. With assistive trackpad, it gives a student a lighter, wider area to work with. Um, and instead of moving the whole unit itself, it gives them that little roller ball to move around. This can be definitely beneficial for somebody who has a, a motor difficulty as well. It also has very large buttons, which makes it easy to click on the screen as well. Switches allow you to interact with other devices. Uh, switches have started to become more popular within the tablets as well because it allows you to interact with a tablet. Um, I have a wireless one up here on the screen in this image here, which plugs into an iPad, and as you tap on it, will allow uh, certain apps to accept the switch input. Um, the app does have to support a switch. Um, not all apps do, but if you usually look at within the comments of an app, you'll find that there is a comment from somebody saying, hey, it does support a switch or it doesn't, um, or you can even contact the developers to find out if it supports a switch. So depending on the disability of a person, um, there are also different switches other than just the tap ones. There's also eye tracking switches and pneumatic switches, which are those that you use to breathe into. Uh, these are alternatives other than a button switch. So going into assistive keyboards, uh, you'll see a lot of these. Uh, I believe we even have a couple of these in our OT classroom right now being used. Uh, they have a high contrast ratio. Uh, these are specifically good for individuals who may have a, a harder time reading or seeing a traditional keyboard. Uh, the higher contrast uh, allows them to see the keys a little bit clearer, and the larger letters allow them to easily distinguish the keys. Um, there's also uh, different, uh, different physical keyboards out there, split keyboards, things like that, that are uh, more easier for an individual uh, with special needs to use. Um, Personally, though, there's also other keyboard layouts out there, too. Uh, right now, what most people use is something called a QWERTY keyboard layout. Uh, there's a couple other ones, like as a Dvorak layout, uh, that just put the letters in a different order. Um, and depending on how you use your keyboard, that may be uh, one benefit to you. Smart boards are a very common piece of, uh, kind of going to our next big leap uh, past inputs of keyboards and mice. 
uh, an input that can be seen is a smart board. And this is a big part of the technology that we use here at Monarch Center. Um, smart boards, when I first started at Monarch, were already in the classroom, and that was in 2006. Um, but the technology has continued to evolve, and we've continued to expand our use of smart boards in the classrooms. Uh, when I started, I believe there were about 10 in the classrooms. Um, right now, between all of Monarch's programs, which include Monarch Center for Autism, a preschool program, and a uh, 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 Monarch, Monarch uh, transitional educational program, which is more for um, individuals who are uh, growing up and uh, needing to know how to work more into a different service fields, and they're kind of evolving past the educational system. Um, these smart boards are used in a variety of different places. Um, so what staff do on these is they build uh, lessons in the notebook software. Um, they can also use the Visual software as well that works well on a smart board. And through the uh, smart board, uh, they are able then to have the student respond and interact. These are great in a small group as well as an individual setting as well. Um, when I first uh, started, we were using smart boards in the classroom, but we did start to see a need to kind of uh, pull individuals aside. Uh, and this was uh, when a student was having difficulties, maybe there was a distraction in the classroom, they were having a hard time um, paying attention to what was going around. So uh, we actually used tablets uh, before the iPad was out, and these were these smart tablets that had about Windows XP on it, and there wasn't very much uh, specs to them, but we would actually load the notebook software on there, too, uh, and we were able to use that as kind of a small smart board. Um, I don't believe that's capable any longer, but that was kind of a cool alternative of something that we used to do with students in the classroom, kind of assist them uh, when they were having trouble in that, in that setting. Um, for a lot of the IEP uh, goals and objectives, we create uh, the lessons, as I mentioned, through the notebook software. Um, and we also put those in the students' folders. Uh, so in our, we have a kind of a network system set up here. So we put all those lessons in the student folder. So if one staff member needs to go and work with uh, a student, they have that same lesson in the folder as well. Um, this, the technology for smart boards has kind of evolved over the last year or so, too. Um, in the past, smart boards used to just have a projector uh, and they'd have a board itself that you had to uh, visually tap on. So go back here, page. Here you can see a student looking working on the smart board there. They're actually tapping on the board itself, the physical board. So this one had a projector usually mounted on the ceiling, projecting onto the board physically. Um, and as the student tapped on the board, it would pick up the input and relay it to the computer. You can also see the tray below there with all the pens on it. As the technology has evolved, though, uh, you no longer necessarily need a board itself. Uh, Smart has started to come out with a technology that has a short throw projector, which means it doesn't have to be mounted to a ceiling, it can be mounted on a wall, and it'll project down. Uh, short throws decrease the amount of shadow that you usually have on the board, too. Um, but their Smart Light Rays one uh, does not need a board and will allow you to project up to a 100 inch display. We actually have a couple of these that we've recently. Uh, started rolling out in our Monarch Transitional Education Program. Um, for us, what's really great about them is you don't have to worry about a board getting damaged as well. Um, sometimes over time, the boards can wear out from pen use. Um, they could also physically be damaged. Whereas we, when you just have the projector, you don't have to worry about a board. Um, it basically just projects it onto a wall. So you do need kind of a uh, clean surface uh, to project that onto. And the surface can't be curved does have to be straight, um, and it can accept up to two to four touch points, uh, depending on the model. Um, when you uh, have it project onto the wall, too, you can also use specific pens to continue to write on uh, the projection as well. Um, with the, these, uh, SmartBoard also has a large library of already created lessons out there. Uh, right now, it's looking at about over 60,000 lessons that they've already have created out there. Uh, the projector also has built-in speakers and microphones. Uh, Smart has also has some other assistive technologies that work with the Smart Board. They have a Smart Response System uh, for gauging students' feedback. Uh, we've trialed these out in the classrooms um, with some of our higher functioning kids. So what's great about these is when you're working with a student, with a group of students in the classroom, sometimes you, sometimes you can have those students um, be pushed socially to answer a certain way or another. Uh, so they may answer by what they think is the correct answer based on what, how other people are responding. Um, so what's cool about this is a student can submit anonymous feedback 
at the at the part of the lesson. A staff member can then click see results and they can see all the results as a whole. This will allow for uh, better feedback to the students of discussing why they thought uh, an answer was one answer or another. Um, SMART also has some document readers, and these are great because your resources are not always digital. You may have some books or documents that you've created yourself that may be in an analog paper form, and you just want to put them up on the screen and have the students mark them up or uh, answer questions on them. Um, I use these in, uh, I think it was my third classroom. Uh, we would take uh, math worksheets that we were working with the students. We'd place them under the document camera. We could do time races on answering questions within those worksheets up on the board. Uh, so we'd have one person come up, uh, answer a, a math question, then the next person come up. I mean, it was already, uh, it was just on that sheet, so we didn't have to uh, scan that into the computer or anything. We would just put it under the document camera. So these are really great because you can freeze and take a picture of them and have it up on the smart board. And then you can still write it up using the smart board pens. This is a newer technology, uh, mini projectors, that we actually just started using within the last week or so. Uh, mini projectors are, uh, they're also known as Tico projectors, um, are basically portable projectors with a battery. Um, so you know your projector is a larger uh, projector that's usually mounted on a ceiling or sitting on a table somewhere. And larger projectors are uh, great, but they are also harder to move about. Um, so if you're working with a student or your mobile uh, employee, as I like to call, where you're moving about to different classrooms or moving about to different areas, this is a great option. Um, what it is is a small handheld projector. You can connect it up to an iPad or you can connect it up to another tablet or a computer. And it'll basically act as a regular projector. Project on a wall, project on a ceiling, project on a floor if you even wanted to. Um, these are great. You can also uh, load them with an SD card as well. And you can put pictures and videos on the SD card and play those directly from the projector without having to hook up another device to it. Um, some of the things that we're starting to trial these with are one-on-one -on -one student interactions where an individual uh, maybe has a hard time in the classroom um, and we're working with them in a, in a smaller area and we need a projector to kind of project on the wall or have them respond or even individuals who have trouble with technology um, who may uh, be a little too rough with it we can just project on a wall and have them respond uh, to the projections. Um, we were also discussing that this might be a great way to kind of teach students stop and go. We can even project stop and go on the floor as the student's walking, uh, and they would be able to see that visual right there on the floor in front of them. Um, the one that we are currently using is something called an AAXA, uh, and it, we uh, purchased these off of a website, uh, I want to say, uh, it was either uh, Best Buy or um, one of those websites. But we, we're just trialing it out right now. Uh, we'll hopefully have more information once we uh, use them a little bit further. Um, here's some different uh, additional information, too. They also have a 120-minute battery life, which is great uh, for using them throughout the day. Uh, they do take a little while to recharge them. Uh, so, one of the big uh, technologies that uh, we're always using out there is iPads. Uh, it's, like it's got cut off a little bit by the image there. But iPads at Monarch Center, uh, we're currently using about 120 of them right now. Um, and that's between all of our programs. Um, and we have a uh, larger campus and we're continuing to grow. So every year we get more iPads in. Um, this past year we replaced a bunch that had been damaged over the last two years. Um, so that kind of helps uh, keeping them cycled in and out, and then also introduces newer technology that comes with newer iPads as well. Uh, for our use, we assign them uh, to teams in the, uh, within our school. So we have right now 12 teams in the school, um, and then individual programs have them usually open to use within that program. And then some individuals have them assigned to them, like SLPs have their own individual iPad. Um, so we use a mix of iPad 2s, 4s, and minis. Um, they've been a great boon to us because they allow us to take our resources on the go. Um, and especially with all the different apps that are out there, we can just load it up an iPad with individual apps and work with a, uh, a student individually. So if there's anything that they're having difficulty with, we can work out with them in one-on-one -on -one setting or even when we're just working on specific IEP goals or objectives. We also collect our data on iPads. Uh, so with our data system, it can be inputted on a computer or an iPad, but a lot of staff members input them on the iPad, and then this gets uploaded 
uh, to our system straight from the iPad. So it's really great. It's a kind of a, a Swiss Army knife of tools for us. Um, one of the things that we've started to use our iPads for too is also video modeling. Uh, so video conferencing has been around for about 10 years or so, but before you had to have a whole room dedicated to a video conferencing situation. Usually you had to have a larger camera set up. Um, I'm, I'm graduated from John Carroll a long time ago, but remember my undergrad and then they also my master's programs, so they would have a whole room set up for video uh, conferencing. And it had a large uh, camera behind a box and a big old uh, CRT TV set up. Um, but now with iPads, you can do basically video modeling wherever you need to go by using uh, software, by recording, excuse me, by using software to record a video or just do it using a software such as FaceTime. Um, with all my uh, traveling about, I recently had a baby uh, about three months ago, little Logan. A uh, little shout out to my little guy out there. But um, uh, when I'm at work or on my lunches and stuff, I like to use FaceTime to call home and uh, just kind of check in with my wife and also see our little guy and kind of talk to them. Uh, so using FaceTime as a video conference ability is a great way to work with individuals on the spectrum as well. Um, now, FaceTime is just one version of it. You can also use Skype or Google Chat to have video conferencing. We primarily use FaceTime because it's built into the iPads and it's also HIPAA compliant. So in a lot of settings where there's a lot larger restrictions, like our program, um, this allows us to keep all that all the videos and stuff confidential. Um, uh, one of the ways that video modeling, um, pre-recorded video modeling is being used at our school right now is um, one of our gross motor teachers, Erin, uh, she's been uh, taking it upon herself to record a, a quite a few videos of how to do particular tasks. Then she's put them in, uh, into Keynote uh, and loaded it on the iPad. And Keynote is kind of a presentation software like PowerPoint. Um, and then she's set up stations with three or four different iPads that students go to. When they tap on the screen, they're able to see the video of what they're supposed to do. So it's really kind of cool to have a video modeling set up, especially in the stations like that. Um, for all the different iPads that we use, um, there are some uh, kind of challenges with that. Um, how we have our iPads set up, we use carts to kind of sync them all. Um, we have four carts right now. Most recently, we got a new one in, which has a new uh, ability called PowerSync. Um, all the carts we use are by a company called Bretford. Um, but the new PowerSync ones allow us to see when all the iPads are charged up and also allow us to set restrictions. Let us know if any iPads have been removed after hours. Uh, this is kind of a good best deterrent uh, device as well. Um, we use a dedicated computer to sync all of our iPads uh, to the computer. Um, and then for protection, for the iPads, we use OtterBox Defender series cases. Um, we've used these over the last few years. We found them very durable. We tested a few other cases that didn't last so long. Um, we do have to switch up our cases about, uh, some of the cases about once every couple of years uh, because they do start to wear. Um, but they do provide quite a bit of uh, protection, especially from iPads to get hit, damaged, or thrown. Um, one of the things that we're checking into this year, though, is a way to make it that those otter boxes can be carried around by individuals uh, who are using them as speech devices. So what we found is OtterBox makes a kind of a latch called an OtterBox a, a utility latch. Um, what's great about these is you can have a strap and just kind of a strap the iPad to it so they can carry it around on their shoulder. Now, in this picture here, you'll see all the different accessories. So it's also got a handheld one and a little pouch. You don't necessarily need all those. You can take off the handheld part, you can take off the pouch, and then it's just the strap holding on the iPad uh, to carry it about. Um, going into uh, how we use our iPads, um, and also stepping next into the apps that we use with our students with, uh, uh, on the spectrum, um, one of the things that we are finding is really a hot topic within uh, the apps that are being used out there are visual scene displays. What a visual scene display is kind of what you just see in this picture here. You have a scene uh, where you have multiple different items or people in the scene, and you need to kind of build an interaction between them. So you want to find out what do we use the TV for? How do we turn it on? Um, who are these people in this room? Or if it was a kitchen, how to make a sandwich? So it kind of gives you a virtual environment to kind of help build language, but also to kind of build a discussion of the experience, what you should be doing within that environment. So going on to our recommended apps, 
Uh, first one I'll bring up is uh, an app called ScenesBeak. Um, it's very versatile. Um, it gives us the ability to use our own custom images, record your own voice. You can also create social stories in here. Now, this app, um, much like the next group of apps that we are uh, going to go on to, are all apps that are visual scene display apps. So uh, you can also use your own text, and you can also animate that text, which is kind of cool. Um, so what you can do is you can change the color of it based on response. Um, you can also lock pages uh, in here. So one of my big uh, likes about apps are ability to customize it and also the ability to lock down those customizations. It's very easy for an individual uh, to delete uh, any sort of apps out, out there, or delete the apps and also delete any customization. Um, so if you're able to lock pages and prevent individuals from deleting it, that's great. Um, also, this one has the ability to back up. So if you have any issues, let's say your device has issues or anything like that, you can have all your stuff that you've created backed up, and then you can just pull it back down to the device. Um, on this one, you can also password protect your settings on there as well. So any of the uh, things that you don't want the individual to get into, you can always password protect those settings. Okay, and this is what this app looks like. Uh, so you can see you can add hotspots to it. So for instance, on the very bottom here, we have a picture of a bus uh, as one of the libraries here. Um, and within this uh, riding the bus, you'll usually have different scenes of what you should do. Um, and you can play back audio from it. You can see they already have a, a library of stuff in there that you can check out um, for this app. Another uh, scene-related app is Seen and Heard. Uh, it's an interactive context-based communication aid and learning tool. Uh, it allows you to import your video, um, and they have things called widgets in them, widget symbols that you can use that are already built in there. So it's got a built-in library of symbols, which is always good and helpful to have in case you don't have a picture of what you exactly need right on hand. Uh, much like the other app, you can record your own vice voice, though, and use your own pictures. However, this one, you can use your own videos as well. Uh, you can link the scenes to create uh, food events. Um, so you can create a couple individual scenes and make kind of a book out of them. Um, and it also has some pre-built-in scenes already in this app. This one starts off at $49.99. So this is what this one looks like. You can have a scene like out on the swing, and you can say what you should be doing in that scene. Autismate is a well-known app, uh, and it's been kind of evolving very rapidly out in the market. Um, I know uh, one of our colleagues, Howard Shane, has been working close with Autismate people. Um, and Autismate is a scene queue based AAC app. You can create scenes from stock library, from their stock library, and you can add a hotspot, or you can use your own pictures and stuff. Um, it also gives you the ability to create quizzes in there as well. Um, once everything's in there, it also has a GPS function. It's also GPS functional, so you can have uh, and you can activate scenes based on location. So uh, I'm going to bring up a video for Autism. Uh, this is a video that recently aired on CNN uh, that I thought was very applicable to this. is changing lives. You probably know a child or a parent affected by autism. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says the number of children on the autism spectrum in the U.S. has increased tenfold in the past 40 years. In some cases, those with the disorder are nonverbal. They struggle to communicate even with their parents. Finding a voice, there's an app for that. CNN Money's Lori Siegel introduces us to a teen named Joey. Hi, Lori. Hey, Christine. Well, we were lucky enough to spend a day with Joe. He's got supportive parents, supportive teachers, and they helped us understand how technology has just changed his life. Take a look. Ordering a sandwich has always been tough for Joe. He's 18 years old, and he has autism. Joe doesn't talk. Joe's never spoken to us. For his entire life, Joe expressed himself by pointing. Do you want a yogurt or grapes? That's what he could eat <laughs> and where he could go. 
even the bathroom. <laughs> he could get agitated at times, even violent. He was biting himself, which a lot of kids on the spectrum will do. And I think that comes out of frustration from not being able to communicate. Put paper plates on the table. But a year ago, his communication skills improved. For the first time, he was able to get through to his mother. He's using an iPad app called Autismate. Joe's still pointing, but his communication abilities have improved. Strawberries. You want strawberries? His interactions, less frustrating. Put the silverware on the table. The app shows him his morning routine. Using technology, Autismate combines a child's physical surroundings with videos of the child in those surroundings. It's Joe in the pictures, which all the other things are those symbols or things, which Joe doesn't really have an imagination. So trying to figure out what the picture meant just made things more complicated. He's learning, and he's much, much calmer. When Joe came to us at 15, really the extent of his communication was he was pushing us away if we were stopping him from something or grabbing what he wanted. But there was no real attempts at verbal language. A fork. Autismate has become a common teaching tool for kids in his school. Putty. Get the putty, Joe. Nice work, bud. That is the putty. You drink with a cup. Nice job, bud. Show me something that goes with seat belts. Card goes with seat belts. You're so good. And we're trying to just give him that correspondence where, Joe, this, this magazine or this putty is represented by this picture right here, literally what you're seeing in front of you. So if you touch what you want here, we'll give it to you. That's how you'll ask for it. Subway is a block away from Joe's school. You want me to go? For the first time, he can order on his own. 12-inch Italian bread. Sandwiches. Italian BMT. Provolone cheese. And chips, please. To, to watch a video of my son go into a subway and order lunch and use a credit card and pay for it, I mean, can you imagine? The progress he's made, really unbelievable. I, I should mention, Christine, Autismate's not cheap. Costs $150 in the App Store. But I I'll say this, it's comparable to a lot of other therapy apps out there. And it's still a lot less than some of the older tech out there, which costs thousands of dollars. And, you know, when it comes down to it, it's an investment a lot of families are willing to make. And, and also a reminder that technology... So from here, you could see how flexible uh, this type of software can be. Uh, allowing an in individual to uh, be able to go to a place uh, to order lunch, uh, even to be able to do things around the house that they would not have been able to before. Um, so this is great. Uh, you know, being able to use something like autism to communicate and to be able to learn more about your environment, and as you heard there, it can really cut down on the frustration the individual feels as well, too. Anytime that you're able to build that communication, that's always helpful. Um, another one of these type of applications uh, that also has this type of uh, technology built into it is TouchChat. TouchChat is known as more of a communication application, um, but TouchChat also has the ability to create scenes in it as well. Um, so you're able to create scenes on the side, uh, or I'll bring up the image here. You'll create scenes, and then on the side of it, you can have this is a kitchen, and have the language right there, and bring up the language for the situation. So touch chat can also be used as this as well. Another one, or another application going more into uh, scheduling is ChoiceWorks. Uh, so another app that we use out there for our individuals on the spectrum, um, ChoiceWorks basically allows you to create schedules. Um, now, you can have schedules for weightings and feelings and everything else. It comes loaded with a preload of 180 images and audio. It is also customizable in the ability to share boards and print boards. So this is what it looks like. So you can have different schedules. Uh, you can have your nighttime schedule and say, first I need to do this, and set times for those as well. Um, and then you can also have just a waiting schedule or a schedule for when you feel something like you're upset or you know, maybe you're happy. Another schedule one that we use a lot is one called Visual Planner. Uh, this schedule app gets used a lot in our Monitor Transitional Education Program. Um, it basically gives you the ability to create schedules, but you can also have micro schedules under these schedules as well. Um, again, another thing I love about this one is you can back up all your schedules, so you can put them from one device to another as well. Um, you can also restrict a lot of the access of uh, items in there, like the clock or editing uh, parts of the schedule as well.
So this is what it looks like. You can have your whole schedule for throughout the day. Um, and then the little steps to the schedule, you can see at the very top there. So when you're saying brush your teeth, these are the steps you should go through to, to brush your teeth. Another uh, app that's out there that's very close to our, our home here is Vizzle. Uh, again, I full disclosure, I worked on Vizzle in its earlier years. Uh, I, and I'm no longer with Modern Teaching Technologies. I am with Modern Center for Autism. Although we're two distinct uh, companies, uh, we uh, both um, are very closely related in that we, we are constantly having good contact with each other and trying out new things in the classroom. Uh, Vizzle um, has a player app that is available on the iPad, uh, and it's also available for Android as well. And the player basically allows you to play back um, any of the things that you've created on the computer. This is great for when you have pre-created activities such as playlists of different activities of matching boards or sorting boards, and you just want uh, to have the ability to access those on the go, you can play those back right there. Um, recently, uh, Vizzle also had a big upgrade, so check it out if you haven't seen any of the changes that have come down from it. But they're pretty cool. Um, another app um, uh, note is Keynote. Uh, this is the app I mentioned earlier in my conversation when I was saying about uh, how Aaron, our uh, gross motor teacher, was using this app uh, to kind of create a schedule uh, in a station of what the uh, student should be doing. What's great about this, though, is you can input video into it. You can have images. You can have anything, just as you would a regular slideshow. You can also just kind of automate that slideshow if you chose to. Um, but it's very, it's a very flexible app out there to use. Uh, this one was an app that actually came referred to me recently uh, from one of our parents, which is iTube List. So, a lot of times you go to show a video on YouTube. Uh, it's actually, why I we were trying to show some videos earlier on YouTube, but it wasn't quite working out, so we uploaded all of our videos here. Um, but usually when you show a video on YouTube, on the left or right-hand side or on the bottom, there may be some other videos that they think you might be interested in. Sometimes these videos may not be appropriate. So what iTube List does is it allows you to create kind of a bookmark uh, playlist of videos and just play back those videos. And they're, uh, they are not saved to the device, but it accesses YouTube and loads those videos, and you just see just those videos. Um, so it helps eliminate a lot of distractions the individual may have when accessing uh, YouTube, but it also helps because they, they're not exposed to some things that maybe you don't want them exposed to. Um, once you create your playlist, you can also lock them so they can't be changed. Um, on iTube, they also have a lot of uh, uh, pre-made up playlists of appropriate videos for individuals um, uh, who are a little bit of a younger age. Um, earlier, we were talking about a app, uh, or a device, I should say, through uh, um, the SmartBoard software that allows you to respond when you're working with an individual or a group. Uh, the SmartBoard Responder uh, allows you to give back that feedback, but sometimes you don't have a SmartBoard. Uh, an app like Nearpod comes into play here where it allows you to have the student respond right in an app on an iPad or whatever you're working on. Now, Nearpod has kind of evolved because that's where it started off. It started off as kind of a response app. Um, but now it allows you to take your own content and upload it to the device. So you can upload, let's say, a PowerPoint presentation or a document that you're working on. And then you can create quizzes that pop up and the individual uh, can respond to them. And then you can receive the results right there on your device. Now, what's great is it allows you to control the other individual's devices too. So if on my iPad I have a presentation, and I would like to share it with three other kids in the classroom, they all have their iPads out, if they all open up Nearpod, I can send that presentation to them, and we can all review it together. Uh, so it's really kind of a great way to kind of share your uh, content with individuals using mobile devices. Now, Nearpod has an iPad, and it also has an Android app out there as well. Um, they offer a silver account, which is their free account, which allows you to upload your content to their servers. Um, I do have to say, though, that it is limited on size, so they also have a paid-for account as well, too. This is what it looks like. Uh, so you can share your actual presentation, and then you can have individuals respond to a quiz, and you can see the results of the quiz as well. Um, going into some SLP-related apps, Autism Language Learning is an app uh, by TalkTime. Um, it uses uh, functional real-life video uh, not still pictures, 
Um, it basically allows you to uh, create different scenes or have different scenes uh, and different actions, um, and then you can kind of piece them together. Um, it's for expressing, it's for teaching expressive language concepts such as verbs, uh, singular pronouns, um, and also plural pronouns. Um, it's also great for teaching who, what, where, when, those type of things. Um, what I like about this app, though, is it does have data collection built into it, so you can collect your data right in the app and then use it. So uh, I will go on to my, probably I'll call this my app of the year, <laughs> uh, because it is getting more widely used every day at our uh, Monarch Center. Um, and this is an app called Volume Sanity. Um, this app is very, very simple, but when loaded onto an iPad, it allows you to set the master volume of the iPad. Now, right now, if you were to pull out your iPad or iPhone, and let's say you had an app that some, could sometimes get really loud. Um, sometimes some children's apps can be like that. Um, and let's say you wanted to set the restricted volume. If you went under accessibility, the only thing it allows you to uh, restrict is the headphone output through the music app. It doesn't let you do it for all the apps out there. So this app allows you to set that master volume to whatever you want. So let's say you want to set it at 50%. And then you uh, close, you go to another app. When you go to play that app, it will only play at 50% of the volume, even if the individual has it turned all the way up. Um, you can also password protect it so that the individual can't go back and try to adjust it, which is great. Um, so there are a few small caveats with this app. It has to be open in the background to work. Um, and then also, if your device uh, dies, like the battery dies or something like that, you may have to close it out and then reopen the app um, to have it work again. Um, but if you keep your iPad pretty well charged um, and, if you, uh, and you close out your apps regularly, this should be a great app for you. Um, and it's really helped out specifically in a lot of our younger classrooms where other individuals can be um, distracted by loud sounds. Uh, this kind of has been a, kind of a lifesaver in those classrooms. Uh, this is an app that was referred to me by a friend, and that is that there are a lot of apps out there like timers and stuff like that, and they're all like $5, $6 a piece. Um, ASD Tools is a set of uh, tools that uh, allows you to create some free custom uh, little timers, stuff like that, that you can use in your session. So it allows you to have uh, a one, two, three step schedule, a timer, a rewards page, and even a first end page. You can use your own photos, um, but it also has a built-in library of pictures as well. And this is what it looks like. And it's pretty simple, but it's free. Uh, so you're able to kind of create quick custom little uh, tools and have those on your iPad. Okay, so now we're going to get to, uh, we've been talking about technologies that are currently out on the market. Uh, right now we're going to get into what's called emerging technologies. Now some of these technologies are just starting to come out at the end of this year. Some of them are coming out next year and some even past that. So I like to talk about emerging technologies because there are technologies that will make a big difference. Uh, before the iPhone came out, before the iPad came out, we didn't really have tablets that had lots of apps and stuff loaded on them. Um, so as time goes on, the game changes uh, with a lot of the different technologies. Uh, and the first category we're going to talk about are wearables. So what is a wearable technology and why is it important? Wearable technology is any piece of technology that you can wear, whether it be a wristwatch, um, a hat, if you will. Uh, <laughs> any uh, glasses or anything like that. Um, early research has shown that this technology can be really beneficial to individuals on the spectrum. Um, and the reason why they stand such a uh, uh, possibility of having such a large change is because there's a lot of things that we take for granted for that we don't know about in our environment that these technologies can help assist them with. Uh, the first category we're going to talk about in this is virtual reality. Now, this kind of sounds like a dated topic because in the 1990s, this was everywhere, or thought to be everywhere. Um, there was TV shows named after it, um, and a lot of people thought this was going to be a big boon, but then it turned out to be a big bust. The reason why was technology wasn't quite there yet. You put on these big, giant, clunky, heavy helmets um, that had a screen that looked like an old CRT monitor, so it wasn't very clear. Uh, it would give people headaches. Um, when you moved about, it didn't really change the scene at all. Um, so a lot of this stuff has kind of really uh, not, didn't really take off very well. Um, within the last few years, though, a company called Oculus started coming around. Um, and in 2014, this past year, 
uh, Google just bought them for $2 billion. So it tells you they have a little bit of faith in their technology. And what Oculus uh, sells, or is going to be selling this year, is a product called the Rift. And it is a headset, a VR headset, but as you move your head, as you look around your surroundings, it looks like you're really there. And how they do this is it allows it to piece together a whole image of a surrounding area using high-definition cameras. And the screen that is in, inside there is a very high-resolution screen that you can barely tell the pixels apart from staring at it. This is a lot like how they describe the retina technology in like iPads or iPhones. Um, so it allows you to really immerse yourself in that environment. Um, what I'm about to show you is an individual who bought uh, an Oculus Rift under their Kickstarter program used it with their autistic child. Uh, so I'm going to play back a video here. So this individual with autism, uh, if you listen to him in this, he, he's reaching for it and feeling like he's really there in that environment. <laughs> you see a bird? Yeah, I see it. Okay, wait. What else do you see, Simon? Tell me. I see lights. You see what? Lights. Lights? What kind of lights? Um, those lights over there. Over where? Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey, look up. I can't see myself. As you can see here, he's uh, he's <laughs> certainly unaware soul. that he can't, or he's certainly becoming aware that he can't see himself in this environment. I'm invisible. You're not invisible, sweetie. Hey, hey. Yes, I am. Look up, look up. Look so, looking at this type of technology and talking about scene displays, uh, imagine in a world where we can create the whole scene right in front of the individual, the cabinet, everything in the room, we can create for the individual we can have a lot more control over that scene for the individual. Um, also think about going out into the outside world where you're going to cross a street and you have a lot of unpredictable things out there. If you really want to test those things with an individual first, you could use this type of technology to work with them to actually see what, uh, what is out there without actually first exposing them to that environment. Um, so this is a little quote I just put up here. Um, and people wonder why Facebook would buy uh, a company like Oculus. And what they're seeing it as is a game type uh, creation, but also the ability to allow people to share in experiences. So if you can create a whole virtual environment, you can basically record something like somebody's wedding. Um, and then somebody would be able to put one of these uh, devices on and be able to see what, what, what it was like at that whole wedding be fully immersed into that environment. Uh, so they're kind of seeing it as a way to kind of really share those experiences with others. Going along the same lines of wearables, um, there's also something called Google Glass. Um, this is a technology that is, well, it's launched. I have down here no current launch date, but it did launch. Uh, but it just hasn't been really widely put out there on the market yet. Um, and what it does is it allows you to have what's called a HUD, which is a heads-up display um, in your current environment. So if I'm looking around in a room and I see an individual in front of me, I could say, pull up their Facebook profile. So you would use face recognition software, find the person, bring up their Facebook profile, and I would be able to see it right there on that little screen above my eye. So HUDs are great for that because it allows you to see more information about individuals and entities in your environment. You can even think about using this with an individual with autism, and when they're out in the environment, we have a hard time making sense of symbols. So if I look at a caution sign or stop sign, you know, a hand up in the air doesn't necessarily mean much to an individual with autism. But if they were looking at that and then uh, the glasses decoded that as stop and told them to stop, that would be very beneficial. So they can also learn more about their environment uh, just from having the glasses on. Another uh, potential aspect for it is uh, emotions. Individuals with autism sometimes have a difficulty understanding what other individuals are feeling. From these, you'd be able to wear it, look at the person. Uh, the glasses could tell when somebody's smiling based on facial recognition, tell when they're frowning, and maybe discuss with or have a conversation with the uh, individual saying they're sad, they're happy. 
help them understand how people are feeling in their environment based on their facial cues. So discussing wearables, uh, another hot topic is always what, what's going to happen to individuals out there um, if we do take them out more into the environment. Um, and one of these things is GPS location type uh, devices. Uh, this company makes something called a pocket finder, which you can put into an individual's book bag, and you can always see where they are. Um, for individuals with elopement, this type of technology is very beneficial uh, because you always have that feeling or worry of, you know, what happens if somebody runs off? Um, this is a great technology because you can always locate them if they did so. Um, they, the, this one was, uh, I think, one of the first ones to the market with this, um, but they're a little bit larger. They are getting smaller. Um, even a company uh, such as Tile, uh, who now uh, this past year launched a Kickstarter um, where now they're rolling out their, pro their product, um, basically makes these little tiles that you can put on things and then locate them with your phone. Um, I have two of these on me right now. One is in my wallet. One is on my keys because I'm notorious for not being able to find these things. Um, but these are basically little squares that allow you to uh, find things when they're lost. Um, so if you uh, want to put these on somebody's book bag, uh, you can detect where they're at based on uh, the little tile. Continuing on to the wearables, um, there's also something called uh, Pebble Watches. Uh, these were another Kickstarter much like uh, the tile was. And basically, it is a watch that allows you to have little information brought up on the screen. So you can check your text messages. You can get notifications on there. Um, it'll vibrate on a notification. So where these uh, have a potential boon uh, are for prompting. So another item on the market for that is going to be the Apple Watch when it launches earlier this year. So if we're looking at individuals and thinking about how we prompt individuals, being able to have a wear device that they could be prompted in a socially acceptable way is an awesome thing to think about. A lot of times right now we prompt by tapping a shoulder or uh, showing individuals uh, something on another device or verbally communicating to them. Being able to send a message to a device they're wearing uh, and being able to have that pop up on the screen is awesome. Uh, so that's actually something that the Apple Watch supports natively by something called tap. So what you can do is bring up this little part here. I can tap on my screen, and all of a sudden, it will, you'll feel the buzz or tap on your wrist. So if you needed to prompt an individual, you could just tap right on the screen, and it would prompt them. Now, that's just one form of it. You can also have images pop up on the screen. You can also have little audio cues, because it does have a built-in speaker as well. Um, so these are just some potential things for a device that's not even out on the market yet, but it has a lot of potential for individuals with autism. Um, one of the cool things, too, is the I Apple Watch also is going to have a lot of sensors built into it as well. One of the things it does monitor is heart rate. And why is that important? Well, when you think about how you feel, when you start to get upset, your heart rate rises. So if something is monitoring how you're feeling, it could let you know that, hey, you may be starting to get upset. Maybe at that time, have a pop-up on the screen to give you some steps to start to cool down or options to do. Um, this way, you don't have to get, you don't have to go as far as to outwardly uh, act on those in possibly a violent or other way. So our next category that we're going to go into is artificial intelligence. Uh, we always think of artificial intelligence as that kind of larger, controlling everything around you type thing. Um, but artificial intelligence isn't quite out there yet, the full version of it. What we do have is kind of more of assistive uh, artificial intelligence where we've kind of built it to answer, respond to certain uh, trigger questions. So things like who, what, where, when, why, those things will all be responded to. Uh, where we're seeing that is in things like Siri, Google Now, or Cortana. Cortana is Microsoft's version, Google Now is Google's version, and Siri is Apple's version. Uh, and these softwares all have the ability to answer questions. Now for individuals with autism, this is a great way to kind of build their communication because they can ask it questions, and then they'll get a response. So it's a great way to teach those who, what's, where, why's, and how's. Um, now, one of the cool things, though, is a lot of these things also have other assistant type, assistive type uh, softwares built into them. So a big part of those, even if, uh, for Siri, is if you run into an emergency situation, you say call 911, based on all the information that's in there, Siri will call 911 for you have that conversation with the uh, dispatcher 
let them know your location, let them know your information. Uh, they can also go into your, um, your health information from Health Book if you have any sort of health complications that you need to let them know about. So this is all great information that in an emergency situation, it could respond for the individual who may not be able to respond. Uh, this gives you a little chart here of how each uh, one responded to a list of questions that were asked of it. Uh, you can see overall, Google now it responds the fastest. Series in the middle there and Cortano's at the end. Um, and what this is based on is its query searches when you do ask it questions. So another big part of these is uh, something new that's coming to the market. Again, we're in the emerging field here, so those ones are already out in the market. What's emerging? Amazon has come out with a device called Echo. Um, right now, you can only get these by invitation, so you put in a request, and then Apple, or excuse me, Amazon will process your order, um, and they usually range from, I believe, like 99 to 199, um, but they use a voice called Alexa on theirs, and basically, this is a device you can put around your house, and it acts as kind of a, a question-answer artificial intelligence, but it also plugs in with your uh, other Android devices as well, so it allows you to create things like lists, so I can say, add to my grocery list, uh, I need more pretzels. And I'll add that to my grocery list. Um, the early results of this device are quite well as far as its response time, as well as its answers as well. Uh, it's also got a very clear voice to it as well. So if you're looking for, uh, for something that is uh, an artificial range of this, you could also use this um, with individuals with autism to have that AI functionality answer those questions as well. This gives you an idea of the type of questions you could also ask. Um, I included a little review video. When we send out this presentation, you can go ahead and access that video due to our time limitations today. I'm just going to skip past that one. Our next category that we're going to go into is robotics. Um, this has been a, a field that has started to emerge even more so. There's about four different robotic fields that are uh, looking at using robotics with individuals with autism. Um, and the reason why is because individuals with autism are found to respond very well to robotics. Um, there's some theories of why that might be. Um, some of it is the, the predictability of the robotics, as well as the range of uh, motion that the, the robots have. So um, how they move and stuff like that can be a little bit more catching to the eye for an individual with autism. First one of these we're going to talk about is, um, I believe it's pronounced Neo. Um, it's a robot created by the uh, Aldebaran group, um, which uh, the individual got the idea of this um, robot from when he was at a robot conference. And uh, a mother that was there with her child with on the spectrum stopped what he was doing immediately and just started responding and copying the robot, which is something he'd never done before. Um, so the NAO has many sensors built into it and can detect such things as touch, so when somebody's touching it to when somebody's looking at it. Um, also, it has sensors to uh, listen to your voice and respond to that as well. Um, it's autonomous in the sense that it can move on its own, it can dance, it can do all sorts of fun things. Um, here you can see all the different uh, breakdowns of it, all the different functions it has. I'm going to play back a quick video of this one as well. We're back now, 744, with a new approach to help kids learn about emotions using robots in the classroom. This is happening at a school in Britain. NBC's Michelle Kaczynski is in London with details on it. Michelle, good morning. Hi, Matt. Yeah, these scientists realize, and quite by accident, that autistic children respond really well to these cute little robots. They teach the children certain skills and help these kids who can have much difficulty communicating come out of their shells. Seems a very human trait to be fascinated beautiful by robots. Were you on a star cruiser? Well, meet this little guy. My name is Now. I can recognize your face, grab objects, and even play soccer like a pro. Mao and Max and Ben are amazing. They stand up by themselves can tell when you're looking at them, which can be a little spooky. Oh my gosh, it's, it's giving me the weirdest look. 
memory game. But the most amazing thing about these guys, made by French company Aldebaran, is how they have captured the imaginations. Do you want to play again? Yes! Yes! yes. Of the autistic children, like Colleen, Stephen, and Daniel, at this British school. Touch my right hand. Congratulations. Yes. With the teacher's guidance, the robots teach them to focus, <laughs> converse, imitate, even pick up on the subtleties of human emotion that these kids struggle to identify. Let me give you a clue. It may be joy, surprise, or mockery. Mockery. Okay. What's your guess? Mockery. If they're um, communicating or interacting with a human being, they're trying to deal with several things at once. Words, body language, facial expression, and that can be quite difficult for them. How does the robot make you feel? Happy. Why? Because he, he feels happy too. Olivier Joubert, with a PhD in neuropsychology and a postdoc from MIT, says this idea came by accident at a robotics presentation after a mother became emotional when her autistic son suddenly started exuberantly interacting with one. At first for the boy. You just want to see the kids smiling. The program is backed up by research, but you can easily see its effect. That's the, the joy of it, really, the fact that the, the children who sometimes struggle to interact with with the teachers and other people, but for some reason they will quite happily interact with the robot. Six-year-old Owen, who started here very insular, saw the robot and immediately asked if he could hold its hand, take it for a walk, stunning his teachers and parents. Owen got his walk with the robot, much to his delight. Well, the appeal of these robots seems to be their simplicity and predictability. But, of course, the goal is to help these children interact better with humans, and that seems to be happening. Some of the kids now have more self-confidence, and two of the kids who were in autistic programs are now completely in mainstream classes. Is there something you wanted to add? I love being on today. Back to you, Matt and Savannah. That's his riff. Michelle, thank you very much. So and cool. now, thank you very much. Yeah. We've had a lot of robots yeah. on this show. Right? This is the most yeah. incredible one I've ever seen. It really is. So he can think, speak, feel, feel. hear. He apparently does yoga. I just saw him do a, an incredibly acrobatic move. But did you see when he was doing Gangnam style before and he started to do the dance back and forth? Yeah. The yeah. balance yeah. Yeah. that he has. Amazing. He goes to the side, doesn't tip over, and how he can stand up on his own using one hand. I know. I can't do that. Well, yeah. <laughs> you could see how it would be. It would really work with kids though, who have autism because, I mean, to... It, it is just so amazing to see a toy do something like that and, and to be able to connect at that level. Completely focuses your yeah, attention. Absolutely. It's, it's impossible to take your eyes off him when he's moving. Fascinating but not intimidating for those kids. Pretty cool. We, we want see it if for you can Christmas. Do it. We wanted it for Christmas. The price point's a little bit high. Can you 000. imagine how popular your kids would be? Wow. If you oh, my how goodness. popular you yeah, would be exactly. if you got it for your kid. All right, well, now, thank we you very much. Now. We love you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Nat and Savannah. <laughs> oh. We'll be right back. So uh, you can see uh, how the students were responding to the robot there. It's kind of really cool to see uh, their interactions with it. Um, also, how their attention seemed to be right on the robot as well. Um, it, it, this is not as a, a foolproof method, but it, to have another uh, assistance out there in order to help educate the individuals is always great to have. Now, another uh, group, also from England, which I don't know what's going on with England with robotics right now, but they seem to be way into robotics. Um, another uh, robot called Casper uh, was, created, was created at the University of uh, Hertfordshire in Great Britain, and it was created in 2005. Currently, there's only three of them uh, for their uh, testing. Um, but what they found is um, when they use their robots is when they put the face on it, they initially tried a more complex face, and they actually had to go back a little bit. Because what they found is that when the face is too complex, the individual won't respond to it as well. This image up on the screen kind of scares what the face actually looks like, though, of Casper. Um, they use these in, to help build communication and also to learn about emotions as well, um, such as like hurt or how you're feeling. Um, here, uh, I'll bring up a little video of uh, Casper at work here as well.
For children with autism, it's sometimes simple things like extending a smile that pose the biggest challenges. Eden Sazenko's mother noticed something unusual about her daughter when she was 14 months old. Eden wasn't playing with her dolls as her mom expected. She'd poke them in the eyes and throw them over her shoulder and, you know, go back to spinning her car wheels. Interactions with others are something that autistic children struggle with. That's where a robot called Casper comes in. British scientists hope it will help youngsters lead normal adult lives. Robot is very predictable. You press a button, the same thing will happen again and again. So there won't be any surprises. So we feel, we think that some of the aspects that attract them, they feel safe and they like to play with the robot is its simplicity and the fact that the repetition. Casper's been specifically developed to respond like one of us. It tickles me. The idea is that he is a simplified version of a human being. Understanding facial expressions are a challenge for little Ronnie Arloff, but Casper, predictable and non-threatening, makes deciphering a smile much easier. Happy! Yeah, happy. We've seen a lot of children coming and immediately hugging it, touching it, playing with it, not only for the first time as a, as a novelty, but ongoingly. It's already, on very basic level, it's something useful. Casper is able to react happily when things are going well, but he's also been given sensors to teach the children not to be rough or violent. So if Casper is, say, struck on the cheek, he turns away, covers his face, and also tells the child that he's been hurt. That's important for kids like Eden, who have trouble reading social cues. We, we try, we're trying to do the happy and sad face. Um, maybe sort of six months ago we started that. And, We'd say to her, you know, Eden, show me a happy face, and she'd go, hmm. And say, Eden, show me a sad face, and she'd go, hmm. It was the same face for every, for every question that I um, asked her. So far, Casper's success has been judged on how well he's helped kids in Britain. But researchers want to get the technology out to the masses. Prospects for a more comprehensive study will depend on teacher-parent participation. The children would have to be tracked for years, but that's a task that Casper's creators say they are up to. Rita Foley, The Associated Press. Robotics with autism is definitely going to be a growing field, um, just seeing how they're used here in these videos. Uh, for, I mean, this isn't something that's not out on the market yet. It, I mean, we'll continue to grow. Um, however, I will even say, like, recently this Christmas, uh, a lot of the Christmas ads that I've seen for kids for toys and stuff has all been robotic dogs, dinosaurs, all sorts of things like that. So it's definitely something more moving to the uh, consumer market as well. Um, right now we're closing up our uh, end of the presentation here. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys know about the services we offer here at Monarch as well. Um, right now we offer a preschool and day school a transitional education program, boarding academy, adult autism program in residence. We offer extended school year, uh, summer social language program, family training and support in social activities, on-site consulting and therapy. And then we also, like this event, offer online resources as well. Uh, if you guys have any questions right now, I'll go ahead and address those. I'm going to go ahead and open it up to any questions that you may have. Uh, so if you'd like to ask any questions, you can go ahead and click on your chat button. You can communicate them to myself or to Lauren, and then we'll go ahead and answer any of your questions you have there. All right, well, if there's no questions, uh, you guys can always contact us back, either via email if you have anything after the fact, um, and we'll always reply to those emails as far as any questions that you may have. Um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, this is, again, a very cool field that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm always interested in these type of technologies, and if you want to email the chat about different technologies that you think might be beneficial, that's cool, too. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Lauren here, uh, but thank you guys for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the presentation.